This world is very different. When I moved here, it wasn't an open door policy, but I was able to get into these studios. Now I don't even understand how you would do that. And because so much work is done at home, yeah. first of all, yeah. the important part is just stay on top of whatever instrument you choose and, and just keep learning. Wally, thank you so much for coming by here. Your name comes up from so many musicians that I have met, that I have sat across from, from Cooch and all these guys, and Lucas, all these guys bring up your name because you have continued to inspire, but you come up, I gotta ask you, Wadi, where did <laughs> Wadi come from? <laughs> Wadi came from a, uh, a guy that I was in a band with uh, when we were kids, about 16, 17 years old, and I was still Bob then. <laughs> he was the one in the band, you know, there's always one guy who's never getting it right <laughs> and screwing up. <laughs> so he would make a mistake and I'd get on his case about it. And one day I was yelling at him about something and out of nowhere, he just went, I'm sorry, Waddy. <laughs> and I just went, what the, don't call me that. What is that? And he says, all right, Waddy. And he kept saying it. And I went, stop that, man. But and then about two years later, I was going, you know, I'm sick of Bob. <laughs> I'm sick of Bob. I think I'll go with that word, Waddy. Yeah. So I adopted it, or it adopted me. Well, you uh, yeah. made it fit as a brand, which is really, really fantastic. <laughs> so many musicians in this town, being out here in LA, mention your name, they talk about you, they refer things to you. You that's, really have laid some groundwork down there. That really has been very pretty kind. powerful. Very sweet. Where did music begin for you? How old are you when you first started becoming closer to having a relationship with music? I was very young. All of a sudden, I realized that when I was a kid, I mean, Let's put it this way, my mother died when I was six years old. Wow. And at five years old, I was looking at a TV with her, and there was a guy on the TV holding a guitar. It was like a big band thing, black and white TV, yeah. and he's strumming this big old jazz box. And I just was, and before that though, I, would, I realized I was singing stuff all the time. Mm. Anything I would hear, I was imitating singers, I was learning melodies, I was always singing something, mm. you know? And you know, you know how you are when you're a kid. You think, you think everybody does the same thing you do. You, know? you think, you think everyone's parents are Jewish. You know, you think everyone eats the same thing you do. Everything's, you know, everything's normal, right? Yeah. And so I think, oh, that's what everybody does. And I'm just learning songs like left and right. And and then I saw this guitar on television, and I was mesmerized. I just, my mouth hung open, and I just looked at my mom. I said, What is that? What is that guy? What is he holding? What is that? What's he doing? And she went, that's a guitar. I went, guitar. Okay, that's what I want. And she goes, that's what you want? You're five years old. I went, I don't care. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I want. Sadly, she passed away the next year. So and then sadly, I argued with my dad for the next three years about wanting the guitar. Give me a guitar. Give me a guitar. And finally, by nine years old, I got a guitar and a teacher. We lived in Jackson Heights, uh, New York. Jackson Heights, Queens, yeah, New York, Queens, for sure. Yeah. I live on Long Island, so yeah. I know exactly where you are for that. Right. So here you are, you start taking some lessons with a local teacher? Well, he was from the Bronx, actually. I don't know how my dad found him, but, and it was great, too, because I'm left-handed. So I was sitting there holding it like this, these days, you know, this whole time, waiting for this teacher to come. And the first thing he did was just pick it up and put it this way. He <laughs> goes, but I'm left-handed. He goes, not anymore. I went, <laughs> oh. oh, okay. All right, fine. I guess so. Okay, fine. Did that work out for you or against you? Well, I guess it worked out for me. It sure yeah, did, in the that's long for run. sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, his name was Gene Dell. He came from the Bronx, and uh, he'd come over once a week, Friday nights, and give me a lesson. You know, every week he'd come, I'd know what I was supposed to know. And sh after a while, he realized, he said, you know, you're not reading this stuff. You know, you're, well, we had this book full of these Bach uh, two-part inventions, piano inventions, and we'd yeah. play them together. So he'd, he'd leave me with one and I'd learn it and then I'd learn his part too because my ear would learn it. So I'd learn his part too and he'd come back and he goes, you're not reading it. I said, well, I'm not reading it because I learned it. What do you want me to do? I said, let me, you want, you want, why don't you play my part? I'll play yours. I learned your part too. He goes, what? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, you know, that's a week's a long time. <laughs> you know, that's my, my ear. He goes, your ear is cheating you out of reading. I said, well, I don't think it's bad. You know, I think it's okay. So how did, how did you learn it? Did you read it first and play it and then you Yeah, I'd read it till I'd got through it. I'd read it through again and by the second or third time, I'd pretty much learn it. Incredible. You know, and that's how my life was so with music. I mean, uh, 
you know, when you're playing guitar, you know, you find what's called a one major, you know. And, yeah. and I real and one day I was playing the one major, learning my Mel Bay chords, and and I moved it down to frets, and and I heard it go, and I went, hey, wait, that's that song Tequila, you know. So I went, oh wow, I can play Tequila now, you know. Whatever I heard, just like before I started playing, yeah, I was hearing songs I'd learned them, sing. This way, I'd hear something I'd learned to play it. Dwayne Eddy stuff. Yeah, Rebel Rouser. I, oh, why right, right away? I need that. I need that thing, whatever that is, the vibrato thing. You know, <laughs> I need that. My father got me an amp. Finally, had vibrato in it. Fender Vibralux. It had a vibrato in it. That's incredible. so. I'm playing Dwayne Eddy. I'm you know learning everything I'm hearing. You know, when you mentioned Mel Bay for the listeners, you know, Mel Bay was a, a book series. Yeah, is that what you were working out of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole one, one through nine or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. That's what Gene was teaching me. Out of so that. you worked out of that, and then yeah. you started learning songs. So what was it about? Were there any musical bands that you were listening to at that time? Well, it was a long time ago, so yeah. you know this was pre ventures. I was listening to Carl Perkins. I was listening. To Elvis came out shortly after I started playing. You yeah. Know? So I was already playing when I saw Elvis on TV. Oh wow! Okay, I, I picked the right instrument. Oh, you know that must have been incredible. Yeah, it was amazing. You yeah. know, just whatever came along, I would learn it. And it, but there was no real. There weren't any bands to hone in on yet. I mean, music then, it was like the, the 50s, and yeah, there was still, yeah. you know, Dorothy Collins and, you know, Pat Boone, and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. then Little Richard, and, you know, everything started happening. But yeah, yeah, yeah. there was no one thing. And then my brother has had a huge jazz collection, so, and I didn't know what I was going to do, so I was just, I'd stay home and learn records. After several years of, you know, playing with, with Gene, I started wanting to learn more. I wanted to learn about, I was listening to all these jazz guys and saying, how do they, you know, improvisation, what is all that, you know? And I found a book one day by Mickey Baker, if you know who Mickey was. I do not. Mickey Baker was Mickey and Sylvia, remember? There was a, they were called Love is Strange, that Absolutely, record? Absolutely, yes. yes. Oh my God. Yeah, so that was Mickey that's Baker. That's incredible. And, yeah, yes. and he was a guitarist, and yeah. he had a book talking about how to play jazz guitar, how to improvise. I went, oh, that's what I'm looking for. And the whole first section of the book was all about chords and accompaniment. I said, I know all that. And I got to the middle, and there was this disclaimer at the f start of this whole section that went, <laughs> this section's about improvisation, and basically nobody can teach you how to do that. I went, well, <laughs> what did I buy this for then? <laughs> but the next sentences were the key to everything. He said, so my suggestion to you is learn everything you like. Copy everything you like. You know, if you like a solo on a jazz record, learn, rock and roll record, whatever it is, and copy all your favorite musicians. Just learn what they do, and eventually you'll start doing your own thing. Boy, very interesting advice. That yeah, it was, that. It, was, wow. it was amazing you know, to me. It was, it was earth shattering, you know, it's like, wow, I get it. And that's what I was doing anyway, was yeah. sitting at home. So then I really started being truant <laughs> and never went to school and just stayed home learning records. You know, and like I said, Jimmy had a huge jazz collection, so I'm learning, you know, everybody, all these horn players, Charlie, Charlie Parker, Donald Byrd, Miles Davis, everybody, the piano players, and guitar players, Kenny Burrell, Chuck How Randy. old are you at this time? I don't know, 13, 12, 13, 12, 14. 12, 13 years old, listening to Miles and Charlie Parker and yeah. Kenny Burrell. This I'd is, say so. That's incredible. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. About that. Incredible. Yeah. And then I got a, a friend of mine, I met a, a friend of mine who went to school with me and said, you're Wach Wachtel, right? I went, yeah, Bobby Wachtel. I went, yeah, right. He goes, uh, you want to play in a band? I went, a band? Yeah, sure. <laughs> what? And it was some, like, uh, a society band, you know, like yeah. fake book, trumpet, vibes. Dance tunes. Guitar, yeah. drums, no yeah. bass. Yeah. No bass, what? You know, it was weird, but uh, we worked. So then I had a gig. You know, it was my first gig. I was about 15, 16 years old, maybe, out of junior high school. Now you're working and you're making money. Yeah, a little bit of money, yeah. So you know, that's starting to fuel you yeah. to want to do more. Yeah, and, and to do less school, which is <laughs> not a, I don't recommend that really, but for me it was working, you know. Yeah. So that was it, you know. It was music just had me before I even knew it did. You know, like I said, you think everybody's the same. So I figured, oh, well, everyone, everyone knows these tunes. Everyone's, everyone's imitating Johnny Ray, you know, when they're yeah. four years old, you know, you're yeah, singing yeah. these songs. and. We were playing in this band, and I met a, a guy who was a really good jazz player named George Bien, B E I B I E N, in Jackson Heights. He was like, you know, like mature for our age. He was old, a couple of years older than me and stuff, yeah. but 
he was like a jazz player. I mean, I didn't, still didn't know what I was doing. And I was playing all the society stuff, but I had this little Les Paul, you know, so I'm playing on this <laughs> solid body. He had a big old fat, beautiful Gibson or Gretsch or Guild, I mean, yeah. nice jazz box. And he mentioned Sal Salvador to me, the great jazz guitar player yeah. that he was teaching. And he was studying with Sal. So I called him up and asked if he would consider taking me on. And I went and met him and he said, yeah, okay, I'll take you on. I found out Elliot Randall studied with Sal also. Oh, Elliot Randall, what a phenomenal yeah. player he yeah. was. Oh. Then I started studying with Sal Salvador. Once a week, I would take the train into New York and go to 46th Street, right above Henry Adler Music. You know, Unbelievable. Around the corner from Manny's. Absolutely. That yeah. New York scene, Manny's and Henry Adler. Henry Adler, who was a phenomenal drummer, drummer and yeah. educator and yeah. publisher and went on to do so many great things. But he had a great school with many great musicians there. That's interesting that you, right. you were part of that. Yeah. And Sal, well, Sal's office was right above Henry's yeah. store. So I'd go there once a week. And then after we did it for a while, and he would he worked me out of like a lot of books. So each week it was like, like nine different books of mallet, really? mallet methods and his, his own uh, string techniques, and I would learn these incredible things. And then, and my father once took me out to, a, I think we saw Chuck Wayne in a club one night, and wow. and he embarrassed me and asked if I could sit in, and I, I did the Johnny Smith Danny Boy thing. <laughs> yeah. And these guys were giving me tips and everything. I was like, hey, <laughs> this is all right, Chuck, you don't mind if I hang here for a while. You know? <laughs> but uh, it was very ama amazing to me. Nice. You and, know, it's amazing when you think about, I also was not a great student in school. But studying music and drumming for me, I was and I couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough books. I couldn't get enough knowledge. I couldn't listen to enough drummers and musicians and right. players, and, and not even just drummers. Oscar Peterson and all these people. Sure. What drove you to learn so much at that point? My ear. My ear just wouldn't stop hearing things, and when I'd hear them, I'd want to figure them out. Yeah. You know, and that's what it was. I mean, I spent my whole life figuring out everything I was hearing. You know, mm -hmm. Beach Boy records, yeah. I'd learn all the parts, you know, Beatles songs, I'd figure out the chords, learn the vocal parts, learn the lyric, you know. I I know the lyrics, I know the lyrics to so many songs, but I know them phonetically, you know. I don't even know what I'm talking about, <laughs> but I know if someone's saying the lyric wrong, you know, I know, I know them as sound. I finally, I told someone the other day, I finally got the joke of one of Warren Zevon's tunes and Poor Pitiful Me, there's a line that's, that's funny, and I went, oh, I get it, that's funny. You know, I never even paid attention to it. I just, I know the line for, yeah. you know, 30 years now. Yeah. But I went, oh yeah, I see, that's, that's comedic, okay, fine. You know, I just learned them as part of the sound. It's all sound to me, you know. So you hear things in a certain way that, that just connects with you, I'm sure mentally and physically. That's a pretty powerful gift. It, it's yeah. wild, yeah. I don't know if it's a gift or a curse, but because it just it stays with me. I just, I hear something, I've got to figure it out. Man. So at this point now, you're playing with the society band, you start to put, work with other musicians, are you meeting other players in the area? Well, I was working with the society band, but I also had the band that with a guy named Wiwadi. Yeah. That was like a surfing band. We had like a little surfing band going. And one of the guys in that band, his name was Carl Wilkenfeld. He and I, all of a sudden Beatles started happening. You know, Beatles came out and vocals started creeping into our world. And uh, aside from wanting to sing every Beach Boys song, we started writing songs. I didn't really get the depth and brevity of how important the writing was for a mm. long time. Mm. But I was nonetheless, at 16, 17 years old, he lived in New Rochelle. I would go on, up to his place on the weekends and that's where these other guys lived. And we'd play these little gigs with the surfing band. Yeah. And then he and I would sit up all night, drinking ginger ale, smoking cigarettes, and writing songs. You know, we wrote a lot of songs. Uh, we never got anywhere with it. And it was sad because one day we finally looked like we were gonna get somewhere with this band. And I went up to New Rochelle and Carl decided to tell me that he was going to do what his father wanted and go to college. Instead, I went, no man, no, you gotta be kidding. Not now, you know. <laughs> we, have, we finally have a shot here. And uh, he goes, no, I gotta do it. I said, ah, all right, okay. And so that never happened. But then I, I met up with some other guys in, in the school I was going going to, yeah, yeah. and uh, we formed a band in the city. And shortly after that, someone from uh, Newport, Rhode Island, happened to be in the club we were in one night, uh, the, the Eighth Wonder, if you remember that club, uh, yes, in yes. Greenwich Village. Yes. Yeah, we were playing at Joel Heller's Eighth Wonder. Yeah. And this guy came up to me and said, hi, I'm, I'm so-and-so, Paul Schnittman, whatever. And, I own this club up in Newport, Rhode Island. Would you guys like to work up there? I went, 
Yeah, Newport, we've heard of that, the folk festival place, yeah, sure. So we went up there and we took the town over, you know, it was great. It was, and that was, you know, Rascals time, you know, it was- right. uh, Young Rascals, what a young great, rascals. great band, yeah. And also, I'll tell you this, at one point my dad got remarried, we moved out to Jamaica, the marriage didn't work, so we eventually moved to Forest Hills, my, the three of us, my brother, my father, and myself. Yeah. And we lived in this building, and there was one building here, and there was an awning, and another building here. And, you know, like I said, I, I was cutting school as usual, and came home, <laughs> walking home one day, and I hear guitar music coming out of a, a, an apartment. I went, some guitar noise. I went, wow, what's that? Someone plays guitar here, what? So I went walking around through the other building on every floor, and columboing my way <laughs> through the hallways, and I found the apartment that the guitar was coming out of. And, and uh, this guy opens the door. And I said, are you playing guitar in here? He goes, yeah. I said, oh, okay. Uh, my name is Bobby Wachtel. Uh, I can help you. Uh, <laughs> you need help, then I can help you. Uh, I play guitar. He goes, yeah. He says, my name's Leslie Weinstein. <laughs> and it was, it's Leslie West. That's where we met. We lived in the same building. Unbelievable. Yeah, and we became total brothers, and uh, we were constantly together. And we put his Vagrants band together, which was another Rascals offshoot. Absolutely, the Vagrants were fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So it was at that time. So we, we went up to Newport, and they were in the city. We just kept playing up there, different, different clubs, and we mainly lived out of one club. There was a drunk we would throw out of the bar every night. This club was, this club was called Dorian's. I'd have this alcoholic guy thrown out almost every night. And then somebody said to me, do you, have you seen the cow sills yet? And I went, what's a cow sill? <laughs> you know, it's not a real New York word, you know. What's a cow sill? What are you talking about? And they said, that's this group, these guys, these brothers. I went, no. So I went over to where they played, and there was just the four brothers, and they were amazing. The best four-part Harmony, Harmonies that were going beautiful, yeah. and they were young. They were babies. John was maybe thirteen, and Barry twelve. Billy, the oldest one, maybe was maybe seventeen. Yeah. Bobby was fifteen. They were astoundingly great, just beautiful. And then I find out the drunk that I kept having thrown out of the club was their father, <laughs> who was their manager. He was just such a rotten yeah, guy. Yeah. But and at one point, driving him home again, you know. He said to me, well, Wadi, I want to manage you. And I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> and he says, my kids are going to make it. I said, those kids might make it. You know, they just might. They're really good. So I said, well, once you get a million dollars together, bud, you know, come see me. And we went from being up in Newport to Vermont. It's starting to get a little thinner up there, you know. Job opportunities were getting slimmer and slimmer. <laughs> Let's put it that way. We're up in yeah. Vermont in ski season, you know, <laughs> 20 below, 30 below. And all of a sudden, I got a call from the club owner that used to help me throw Bud out of the club, saying, I'm working for Bud now, and he still wants to sign you, man. He's, he's got the money now. I, I said, what? And he says, and he put Bud on the field. He Wadi, I'm coming up there tomorrow. Came up, heard the band. This was a different, by then, it was a, another uh, version of the band. Yeah. And he says, band sounds great. And he goes, uh, and I got the million dollars now. You want to come with me? I went, yep. Get me out of Vermont, please. Let me get out of here. And shortly after that, he moved his whole operation to California. And he says, you want to go with me? I said, definitely. I couldn't get in a, a job in the, in the city. I could mm -hmm. not, you know, Leslie got a deal. Vagrant's got a record deal. I couldn't even have the nerve to try to walk into Atlantic Studios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was such a uh, closed off business in the city. Mm. So I said, yeah, man, let's go to Los Angeles, please. So you come out to Came sunny out. Southern California. 1968, I think it was. Nice. Summer, summer of 68, nice. something like that. So you came out here now, a very different vibe in a scene yeah. from what you were experiencing yeah. on the East yeah, Coast. Yeah, very different. And we were being paid to just write and rehearse. Right. We didn't want us to do anything. What? What? Uh, okay. So uh, there was a great girl named Judy Pulver in the band with us, and she wrote the lyrics for me, and I wrote the music. And... And this was a very good singing group, very good five-part harmonies and in tune, really good. Mm. Eventually, the band wasn't working. It wasn't happening. I met Dave Crosby, who was one of the first people I met when I came here. Yeah. Asked him to come hear us, and he did, and he, he, he dug it. And then he called me one day, he said, you know, Wadi, I gotta tell you, 
you know you're the only one in that band, right? And I went, oh man, please don't tell me that. He goes, you know it's true. You hear what I'm saying, right? And I went, yeah, I guess so. Things started getting a little harder knowing that that was, you know, this, there was a strain on the band. And, and we, again, we weren't working. We just kept writing. And since Judy and I were the only ones writing, everyone else was just kind of... And you were being paid to just do We this. were just being, you know, given a little allowance each week to do yeah. nothing. And I got sick of it. And I, I fired everybody. And I said, I'm not quitting. You're fired. <laughs> because the, the vibes were getting really bad. And by then I had met... Uh, Keith Olson, who was, you know, the brilliant producer, yeah. engineer. He was yeah. an engineer for his partner named Kurt Betcher, who passed away. And I'd met a couple of studio musicians through them. And I heard them play it, and I went, well, man, I, I think I play as good as these guys. You know, I can, I can hold my own with these guys. That's what I want to do. I want to become a studio musician. Yeah. I want to become a, a session guy. So I fired the band. Judy and I moved in together. I got a uh, job through, actually through Bill Council, who finally had a huge argument with his dad and split the councils and left. And, I, and it's funny because there's a movie about them, Family Band it's called. Right, right, right. And in that movie, I, I learned that the thing that was the straw that broke the camel's back was this argument he had with his dad about me. And, I went, and I, when I saw the movie, I was, I was in tears. I couldn't believe it. Well, think about the influence that you had. I mean, that, that must have been incredible. Yeah, it was amazing. Really? It was totally uh, overwhelming. But so Bill gave me my, the first session I did uh, outside of our own recording of the band that we had, these demos we did. And so I think I, I met Jim Keltner that night. Sneaky Pete was playing pedal steel. Yeah. I don't remember who was playing bass, but uh, there I am on a record date. And from there, then Keith Olsen started hiring me to do sessions. About what year is this? Well, this is, would be 69. So late 60s. Yeah. Keltner's out here. You're starting to connect with the session scene that's going on. Yeah. 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 I met Jim and I met a couple of the uh, real uh, important guys in this t town at that time. Bill Plummer who was a bass player. Uh, Wolfgang Meltz was another yeah. bass player. Ben Benet. Next thing I knew, I was on a session with Sklar. Uh, on a session for Bobby Womack. Keith Olsen was producing Bobby Womack. Yeah. And there's Lee. And I've been sitting around before, you know, after I broke the band up and I was living with this friend of mine and this guy had a great Fisher amplifier. So we would sit around listening to music all the time. That's just what we do. Yeah. And I'm looking at these records and Lee Sklar, Russ Kunkel, and Danny Cooch. And I'm listening and I'm seeing their names on everything. I'm yeah. like, who are these guys? And why is this guy Cooch getting all that work? Why can't I get this work? <laughs> you know, what is this with him? And, and then so eventually I met Leland, was the first one of, of our group that I met Yeah. on uh, this Womack session. And we hit it off right away. And a couple of weeks or days or something later, I was, I was driving a 57 Chevy, gray 57, you know, not gray, what's it called, primer 57 Chevy. Yeah. And I was pulling into SIR and this other 57 Chevy was coming out the driveway <laughs> and he pulls over and we're stopped right in the middle of Santa Monica Boulevard and he goes, are you Waddy? I went, yeah. Are you Russ? And it was Russ. <laughs> and I went, oh man, okay, it's good to meet you. He goes, I gotta go. But he says, we're gonna be seeing a lot of each other. You know, I said, okay, good. After the Bill Council stuff, one of the writers of Werewolves of London, uh, who's up there in heaven with, with Warren right now, mm -hmm. Roy Marinell, mm -hmm. he came to the one gig I did with my band. And <laughs> we finally did a gig with this band before I broke it up. And he loved it. He loved what I was doing. So we got together <laughs> and he introduced me to a producer named Nick Vinay. And Nick was the producer of Linda's first record, The Stone right. Ponies. Linda Nick, Ronstadt. Yeah. And also, Nick produced the first Beach Boys album. I didn't know about either of those then. Uh, you know, I mean, I knew those records, but I had no idea who produced them or yeah, what. Yeah. But anyway, he brought me to Nick, and I played on something for Nick, and he really liked what I was doing. So he started hiring me a lot. That's when I started getting into a, an actual groove of, Oh yeah, I got a session tonight. Oh, I got a session tonight. I got to yeah. go do a session tonight. And, yeah, and started getting around with a couple of other local producers and stuff. But finally, one day, Nick said to me, "It's time for you to move on." Really? And I went, "What does that mean? You're firing me?" He goes, <laughs> "No, no, I'm not firing you. It's time you move on from here, man. You, you're better than what we're doing. We were wound up doing a lot of these folk albums, and I was yeah. having to play acoustic all the time." And he goes, "So." Tomorrow, he says, there's a new hotshot piano player in town. His name's David Foster. And 
he just got here and I invited him to the session tomorrow night to come play on the session. But basically I did it because I wanted him to hear you. How beautiful. Yeah, it was amazing to me. I, I know I use that word a lot, but yeah. the whole thing is pretty... Amazing fits. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he said, so bring your electric gear tomorrow. He says, and I want him to hear you play electric. I want him to hear you play slide. So I said, okay. And so I did, met Dave. We played a few songs, did what I do. And like two nights later, the phone rang and it was someone from Lou Adler's office calling saying, you're wanted to come on this session uh, for, it was either uh, Peter Allen or I think it was Tim Curry. And it was Dave and it was Cooch and Leland and Russell. Yeah. And so now I'm going to finally meet this guy, Cooch, who I hate because he's got all his work <laughs> and I don't, don't like what he's doing. Danny is an amazing guitar player and I've interviewed him, so his story is just wonderful. That's hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> the best thing was I mean, we fell in love with each other instantly. Yeah. And it was, they wanted to do a reggae tune and that was all I was living for at that time. Zivon and I and my friend Jorge Calderon, mm. we just could not get enough reggae. It was harder they come had come out and we were me totally stunned by it. Yeah couldn't get enough. And Danny was the same way. So we instantly communicated heavily and became lifelong friends at that moment. Yeah, yeah, and beautiful. and as we still are, as you know, because yeah. now, the, now the four of us plus Steve Postella are in a band. So yeah. it's a, 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 quite a wild reality. It's been amazing to see the, the interviews that I've done and hear the stories. And when I sat down with Lila Sklar and sat down with Danny Cooch and just hear the stories in Kelter, you know, there was a there was a vibe going on what, years ago that was just so deep of great dedication to produce great music and great writing and great creativity. It was, guys were doing it all. It was the most explosive musical period that I think has ever happened yeah. in this country. Yeah. It was like what happened a few years earlier in Liverpool. It was, yeah. that, it was an explosion where... You couldn't work enough with people. You you wanted to be involved in everything. Everybody was writing. Yeah. Everybody was trying to do as good as they could. And in the studios, if you needed somebody, you just think of someone and they'd show up. Yeah. About a week after I met Dave Crosby, he called me and said, I want to ask you something. I said, what? He goes, what would you think if I was to put a band together with Graham Nash and Stephen Stills. I went, what do I think? <laughs> Gee, let me think. Um, I don't have to think. It's going to be the biggest band in the world forever. That's what I think. You know, that's when we moved here. Yeah. David was producing Joni Mitchell. Oh. You know, so then I'm meeting Graham. I'm meeting Stephen. We were, we rehearsed SIR. SIR was just a rental place. And they had these two big rooms in the back. And my manager noticed it and said, you know, what are you doing with those rooms back there? And they said, well, I don't know. And they said, well, we need a place to rehearse. Can we rehearse back there? So that's what started SIR's that whole life. Hysterical. And the only people that were in there was my band and Crosby, Stills and Nash. We were so incestuously connected. <laughs> I would walk home with my guitar, thinking it was my guitar, open it up, it would be Steven's guitar. I went, oh, I grabbed the wrong one. <laughs> you know, and, and my Les Paul that I've played all these years, my 60 Sunburst, I bought from Steven, you know. It's like everything was so connected, and then but there was then, there was magic going on at that time. Yeah, and it really was amazing. It was truly amazing. Yeah. J.D. Souther, we became closer than anybody could be. Yeah. Lowell George, Warren, the Eagles, Jackson, everything was happening right yeah. then. Yeah. That was the birth of everything, and we were right in the heart of it. You know, so the more every time you'd go in the studio, you'd meet another one of those people, you yeah. know, and you'd, or you'd, there you were writing with someone, and you know, I'd be sitting at JD's house with him, David Crosby would show up, we'd be working on a song, he'd chip in, you know, chime in. I'm working on uh, Jackson out of nowhere, I meet Jackson Brown through Warren. Warren and I, I met Warren playing for the Everly Brothers. He was the band leader for the Everly Brothers. Yeah. He introduced me to Jackson, and Jackson called me and said, I need you to co-produce his next record with me. Went, what? You don't even know me. He goes, yeah, I know you. And we're doing that record. And I said, and I'm thinking, that I'm hearing this one song. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I need backgrounds on this. I need like Beach Boys backgrounds. I know. Linda Ronstadt, what are you doing? Nothing. You want to come down and sing with me? I need some Beach Boy back. She goes, she goes, I'll call Jennifer. Jennifer Warrens and Linda come down <laughs> within a half hour. And the three of us are singing backgrounds on Warren's record. You know, Don Henley and Glenn Fry are hanging out with us at night. You need anything? No, we're fine, man. Just hang, man. You know, it was it was like a, a brotherhood, a 
sisterhood, a club. It was a giant music club. Yeah, That's what it was. It was like a big club full of the best people you could know. Well, really well the best people, I don't know about that. But, <laughs> you know, the best musical people. Best musicians yeah. that were at that yeah. time. It was wonderful. It in was, one area, it yeah. must have been unbelievable. It truly was. We did the Tim Curry record, and then, then Lou hired me to play for Carol. And then once we did that, we toured a little with Carol, and then Peter Asher saw me playing with Carol, and he called me to come play for Linda. What was it like with Linda Ronstadt? She was the the girl you hear singing. I mean, she was breathtakingly in tune, loud, and just beautiful. She knew what to do. She would pick the songs, you know, she knew what to do. And what was great about it also was with Peter, when I got on those sessions, they went about it differently. Uh, those vocals are live. Like Linda's vocal on Blue Bayou is the vocal she sang when we cut the track. Mm. That's what they were going for. It's not, most of the time you would be in the studio and people are doing a guide vocal. They call it a guide vocal. Then the singer will sing the real vocal. It wasn't like that with, these, with Peter Asher's production. They were going for it. Peter, Linda, and James, same thing. That vocal is the one. You know, that's it. And it's a great way to do it. It's like you're really performing. That's why it was so important for Peter to have us be the band because that's the band who collectively made that sound. Yeah. So you wanted to represent it the same way on stage. And how much did you rehearse? What was the, what was the schedule like? I mean, you know, you'd do an album. The album would still be pretty fresh in everyone's head. So you'd just kind of go to a rehearsal place and run it down and uh, you'd be out pretty, pretty quickly on the road. It was, so there wasn't that much time. There wasn't that much turnover time in between. Yeah, really. it was fast. You know, you'd go out of the studio and everybody knew what they did. So it was, all right, we're booking a tour and we're all going. And, but you got involved with some film, some films too, some film scores. Yeah. Joe Dirt, Up in Smoke, yeah. The Longest Yard. Well, Up in Smoke came first. That was through Lou. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Danny and I wrote together for that. Yeah. And yeah. what was that like doing the film score? That was a different way of thinking at all? Or? Yeah. Well, well, that one, not as much. Well, that was still, because we were still kind of doing rock and roll stuff. You know, yeah. we were doing guitar band yeah. stuff on, on Up in Smoke. When I did the work on Joe Dirt, it was full orchestra. And that was very different. Yeah. And I loved it. I still love it. I don't get to do that much of it. But, you know, after, after spending a lot of years in the studio um, producing someone, producing an artist, mm. to have the luxury of just going in and writing the music and hearing it played back by an orchestra. Yeah. And that's it. You didn't, I didn't have to make sure someone was comfortable. I didn't have to get the vocal out of somebody you know I didn't have to talk real nice to somebody I didn't have to baby I didn't have to coddle somebody <laughs> that day or have to put up with someone's bad mood yeah. it was just all about the music it wasn't about the singer and the songwriter right, anymore right. you know it was right. and my first film Joe Dirt was I didn't know what I was doing I'm writing these things and they put me with an orchestrator a guy named Scott Smalley who was really good and he goes you know you're writing this really big I went I am I don't know what I'm doing. You know? <laughs> I'm just, I'm hearing what I'm doing and I'm just trying to write it. You know, I was new to sequencers. I didn't know anything about this stuff. He goes, you're writing for like 90 pieces. I went, what? <laughs> uh, really? Wow. So uh, we went to Sony with it and they, they okayed it. So we had, my first movie date was a 90 piece date. Unbelievable. You know, just, just in shock hearing orchestra play back everything that I wrote it was overpowering. And there were people that Joe Picaro was in, in that. It was out there somewhere. When yeah. Joe's out there, Emil Richards, who just passed, who just was passed there. there well. And Mike Lang. Do you know Mike? Yes, absolutely. Sure. So I, I'll tell you a funny thought. It's, Mike is always amazing. Yeah. There we go again. Yeah. Dressed to the nines properly. Very sharp, yeah. Very sharp. Yeah. So we're ready to start my session at Sony. There's someone missing. Who's missing? What do you mean someone's missing? Who's missing? Mike Lang. Mike Lang? How could he be missing? He's like the most professional one of all of us. <laughs> How could he be missing? All of a sudden, this door flies open, and in comes Mike in like a T-shirt and jeans. I went, what happened to you? <laughs> What's with you? He goes, oh, Waddy, I'm sorry I'm late. But I went, wait a minute. Is this your idea of a, you think this is a rock and roll date? Is that why you dress like that? He goes, 
Yeah, it's not. I went, get out there, will you? This is a 90-piece orchestra date. He goes, oh, no. <laughs> I'd never seen him out of a uh, suit and tie before. <laughs> and it was very, very funny. That is great. Really funny. You know, the, you, we, we mentioned that you started to do some production credits, you know, with Stevie Nicks, Keith Richards, Jackson Brown, Brian Ferry. What got you involved in, in, in the production end of it? Well, I guess starting with uh, Warren. You know, Jackson giving me the opportunity to produce Warren with him yeah. led me into producing more people. You know, I was pretty good at it. I could I could get a vocal out of someone. Yeah. I knew how to make get the, the band to play the right stuff, hire the right guys, which was so easy in this town. Yeah, yeah. Get the arrangements down. My version of production was arrange the song and then work with the singer to get the vocal and then add anything I could, you know, background wise, accompaniment wise. Fantastic. Strings wise. How did you keep the business side organized? You know, were you, were you, you know, because when you're doing these dates, you're, was it? Did you have to have a calendar or a book? How did you organize? Well, it? I had a book. Yeah, I had a book, yeah. and just had just filled it up. You know, just booking dates. You know, yeah. and business wise, I was told early you need a business manager. You need mm -hmm. an accountant. Yeah. So I instantly got an accountant and went through two different ones, and I'm happy to say I'm still with. Uh, the man I've been with for about 35 years that now. That is fantastic. Yeah, he's great. Nick Benmere has just been wonderful to me. And he's kept that side of the math going. Yeah. And I would just, I was able to, you know, not be late either on these dates. And, you know, <laughs> you'd be working three dates a day. Yeah. We were, when, when Russell and I did Stevie's first solo record, that was like the third session that day. You know, I saw him in the morning. I you know, worked somewhere else in the afternoon. We met up again at Studio 55 that night. Yeah. You took this really professional, you showed up on time, you were yeah. prepared. Those are amazing qualities <laughs> as you went through the intensity of all this business. We have these young students that watch this and they, and they are familiar with what you do, they're fans of yours. In closing, what would you say to this next generation of what they can prepare themselves for? What, what skills do they need for them to find success at their dreams? Well, like Mickey Baker said in his book, learn everything you like learn every solo you like, get really proficient on your instrument. You should learn how to read, you should learn as many songs as you can. Be prepared to deal with the word no a lot, because mm. you're gonna run into it. And, and I would say don't give up on your dream. But that, you know, that's, that's like a cliche kind of, but yeah. at the same time, because I mean, I, at one point I stopped playing. When I got to be like 16 years old and my dad had remarried, I was like, what am I still playing this thing for? I tried stopping, and for me it didn't work. Yeah. You know, So if you're thinking of stopping, I suggest stopping and see if it works for you, because mm -hmm. if you want to stop, maybe you're, maybe you're not a musician. Yeah. You know? but, and if you are, you won't stop. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, this town is very different. This world is very different. When I moved here, it wasn't an open door policy, but I was able to get into these studios. Mm -hmm. Now I don't even understand how you would do that. Yeah. And because so much work is done at home, yeah. first yeah. of all, yeah. and there's very few studios around. Yeah. But the important part is just stay, stay on top of whatever instrument you choose and, and just keep learning. That's what happens every day to me still. I'll, I'll find a note, you know, it's like, I, I'm stealing this from someone, but I just learned this the other day, that the song, for example, uh, Rock and Roll by Led Zeppelin. Yeah. The drum intro. You're a drummer. Yeah. You know, that, you know, you know how to do that intro? How did you figure it out? I figured it out by numbers and counting. And I, I thought it was after beat one. And I, I was talking on the phone with Steve Jordan one day. Steve goes, because we were doing it with Stevie. We're doing yeah. it in Stevie's show. Yeah, yeah. And so I taught it to the band one. Da, 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 da. Steve goes, no, man. It's after three. I went, <laughs> what? Three, yeah. What? No, no, it can't be. He goes, it's after three. <laughs> so I went back, but there's still more. This is, this is going to blow your mind. I said, all right. So I went back and told the guys, all right, I was wrong. It's not after one, it's after three. So the other day, I told Drew Hester, is our drummer for Stevie's band, who's mm -hmm. fabulous. I said, we're going to do rock and roll. So you know that intro? He goes, yeah, Johnny Be Good. I went, what? <laughs> Do you know this? Yeah, no, but uh, he goes, incredible. yeah, it's Johnny Be Good. And think of it. <laughs> it's Johnny Be Good. It's the guitar <laughs> intro. He said, yeah, that's what 
somebody, John Paul Jones said it in some interview. He goes, yeah, Bonzo was doing Johnny B. Good. <laughs> so it's not, you don't even have to worry about three anymore yeah. or one anymore. It's Johnny B. Good. That is hysterical. You know what I mean? So learning. And so, and I was on the phone with Drew. I said, all right, look, I got to go. <laughs> I got to call Steve right now. I got to call Jordan right now. And he and I were on the phone almost crying together, <laughs> laughing and crying. I can't believe what an amazing clue that is. But the fact that you still have that desire to learn. But that's what I'm saying. That, that doesn't go away. If you're a musician, you live for something like that every day to find out one note you were playing was wrong in a leg or you discovered the right way to play something yeah, that someone's yeah. been doing. Those are the things that really matter and writing and music won't leave you if you don't leave it you know it never left me so i don't think it's about to it is clear that music hasn't left you because you've got way more music inside of you with all these stories and this incredible influence that you continue to share and inspire people for that wedding i thank you so much oh, you have done fantastic oh thank Beautiful. you very much thanks Tom. <laughs> Dom Famulari here, the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.